Our sun is approximately 4.6 billion years old. That's how long it's taken for gravity to pull our planet together and act upon it to help produce us. The number of other suns in our galaxy alone is in the hundreds of billions. Many with planets, many planets just like our own. Our Milky Way is just an ordinary spiral galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, each with hundreds of billions of stars and planets of their own. You can see how just saying these numbers doesn't really capture what they mean. Latest estimates claim there may be more Earth-like planets in our universe than all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches combined. And this has been going on for over 13 billion years, at least. The idea that other intelligent civilizations like our own have not developed anywhere else in the universe during that time, with all those stars and planets, and all those galaxies, seems unlikely. In fact, if we focus on just our galaxy alone, there's already an equation for determining that likelihood. The Drake Equation. Of course, we don't know the exact value for any of these variables, so we can't really run the calculation. But based on the size of some of the numbers we just discussed, which are actually much larger than what Frank Drake assumed they were when he formulated the equation in 1961, it's likely that n equals more than 1, at least. But rather than a real attempt to pin down any exact number, the equation is better thought of as a Fermi problem, a problem which involves multiplying a series of estimates that yield the correct answer if the estimates are correct. The Drake Equation acts as a summary of the main concepts scientists must deal with when confronting the Fermi Paradox, and if we knew the exact values for each parameter, we'd have the exact answer. In 1950, 11 years before Drake's equation was presented at the first SETI meeting, Enrico Fermi kicked off the serious scientific speculation about the possibility of extraterrestrial life over lunch with a few colleagues at Los Alamos National Laboratory. After an earlier conversation about the lack of any real evidence of alien life forms, the conversation moved into the more mundane. But then out of the blue, Fermi asked the question, Where are they? And everybody immediately knew what he was referring to. And that's why we call this question the Fermi Paradox, even though Fermi was not the first, or last, to seriously ask the question. If all these Earth-like planets exist, and there's all this probability for intelligent life to evolve and broadcast detectable signals, why haven't we detected anything yet? Where is everybody? You may not be surprised to learn that many people have proposed many interesting and thoughtful responses to Fermi's question over the years. Ideas and criticisms around which, naturally, much debate has occurred. I'm going to read through some of my favorites now from the wiki page and then speculate on what this all can tell us about ourselves and our own situation here on Earth. It's probably best to start off with the Great Filter Hypothesis, since that represents one of the most comprehensive and all-encompassing theories. The Great Filter, in the context of the Fermi Paradox, is whatever prevents dead matter from giving rise to expanding and lasting life. The idea was first proposed in an online essay titled the Great Filter, Are We Almost Past It?, written by economist Robin Hansen in 1996. With no real evidence of intelligent life, other than ourselves, it appears that the process of starting with a star and ending with advanced lasting life must be unlikely. This implies that at least one step in the process must be improbable, and therefore act as a great filter which prevents intelligent broadcasting civilizations from developing in the universe. Hansen's list, while incomplete, describes the following nine steps in an evolutionary path. Step number one, the right star system. One that is filled with all the elements and materials that allow for habitable planets to form and lead to organic life. 
Without that, you won't even get on the ground, let alone off it. Step number two, the emergence of reproductive molecules, such as RNA. Those will be basically the amino acid chains floating in the primordial ooze, so to speak. Step number three, simple single cell life. Basically just reproductive molecules that have devised a better strategy for propagating themselves, but still pretty basic. Step number four, complex life. Still single celled, but with a nucleus and mitochondria and all that good stuff. Many people don't realize how tricky it probably was to get from simple prokaryotic cells to complex eukaryotic ones, but it would have likely been just a chance encounter between a larger and smaller cell with different functions which, when the smaller one was eaten, instead of being digested, it thrived inside the larger cell and helped turn its food into energy. That's the story I remember about mitochondria from science class at least. Anyway, step number five is sexual reproduction. So now you've got cells swapping their DNA, contained in the nucleus, and this leads to the explosion of evolution and natural selection for the best performing cells. Out of this comes step number six, multicellular life. Obviously now we're getting bigger and even more responsive and adaptive to our environment. From there it's no problem to spread across the planet and start filling every niche available with various expressions of life. Step number seven, our big brains now allow us to begin using tools and manipulating our environment, leading to civilization and the rest of what we see around us in society. Step number eight is where we are now. Discovering science and building technology advanced enough to broadcast our existence and eventually ourselves, or at least our technology in the form of self-replicating drones and whatnot, into the rest of the galaxy. Step number nine is a colonization explosion. Each step along this process poses a difficult challenge to the evolution of intelligent, broadcasting life. It may be the case that we've already passed the most difficult stage and are on a course to colonize the galaxy with relative ease. Or it may be the case that we've only covered the basics so far, the easy stuff. Countless numbers of civilizations might have made it to this point and then something happens. Let's go a little deeper into step 9 to get a better understanding of what the colonization of a galaxy entails, before we make any further inferences about why it may be the case that we haven't been able to detect anything yet. Starting with the Kardashev scale, there are three types of civilizations, numbered 1, 2, and 3. According to the likes of Carl Sagan and his former colleagues, Earth is only at a .72 on the Kardashev scale as of 2012 not even a Type 1 civilization yet. A Type 1, referred to as a planetary civilization, is defined as being able to use and store all of the energy which reaches its planet from its parent star. So that includes not just direct solar energy, but the energy of winds and tides, etc. Michio Kaku thinks we'll get there in about one or two hundred years. Type 2s are called stellar civilizations because they harness the total energy from their parent star usually using something like a Dyson structure. It'll probably be several thousand years before we get to that point, and many people think we never will. The problem here isn't that we don't have the right technology, but rather that building a Dyson structure would involve the gathering of materials on such a massive scale that we'd have to literally harvest the cores of entire planets. We can't just go around destroying planets in our own solar system, so a project of this scale would involve hundreds of years of industry and the transportation of materials from nearby solar systems, all with no immediate commercial return. And let's not forget that the closest solar system is something like four or five light years away, which would take pretty impressive improvements in our technology just to get there. Type threes are called galactic civilizations and essentially that's the point at which total colonization of the civilization's home galaxy has occurred, and their technology is so advanced that they can and will harvest and use most of the energy from the entire galaxy. This could take anywhere from 100,000 to a million years from the point we're at now. It's interesting to think what a Type III civilization might look like from outside of their galaxy. Since they'd be harvesting and using all sources of energy, there wouldn't be anything emitted in terms of light. So it might just look like a big empty patch of space to us. 
Even more interesting is the fact that these curiously empty patches of space do exist, and scientists have no good explanation for them.